We're now going to think about hypothermia. Hypo, of course, means low, thermia, heat, low body temperature. Now, hypothermia, make no mistake, is a serious, life-threatening condition and must be taken very seriously. And hypothermia, we're talking about a reduction in the body temperature at the core of the body, the core of the body in the main organs, when these become too cold. And this is normally defined as any body temperature, any core temperature, below 35 degrees centigrade. Anything below 35 degrees centigrade technically would be defined as a hypothermia. Now some American sources define it as below 34 degrees centigrade. But believe me, if your body temperature is 35 degrees centigrade, you are cold. And this needs to be recorded, the temperature needs to be recorded to reflect the core temperature of the body. So there's different ways you can do this. You could use a rectal probe. Actually, under the tongue is not too bad because that's detecting the temperature of the blood which is going towards the brain to a degree. People sometimes use esophageal probes as well. So you've got to work out a way of recording the temperature, reflecting the temperature at the core of the body. You're never going to do it accurately unless you can actually put um, a thermometer in the pulmonary artery or something invasive like that, which I wouldn't normally recommend apart from in, in very extreme intensive care circumstances. So normally orally or, or rectal temperatures would be recorded. So any, any, body te any core temperature below 35 degrees centigrade, I'm going to define that as, as a hypothermia. Now, when we're talking about hypothermia, normally we mean accidental hypothermia, hypothermia which has happened by accident. Now, in some aspects of healthcare, people do induce hypothermia, but at the moment we're talking about accidental hypothermia. It's just an accident. Why does this happen? Well, very often, especially in the elderly, it happens secondary to some illness. For example, the patient might have uh, had a heart attack, it could be an MI, they could have had a, a CVA and they're stuck at home, immobilised because of the illness and if they're in a cold environment that combined with the immobility can induce hypothermia. Over time the patient can become hypothermic. Some illnesses will contribute towards the hypothermic process, for example patients that are hypothyroid. Remember thyroid hormone stimulates the metabolic processes of the body. It's metabolism which generates heat. So if someone's hypothyroid, very often they feel cold because the body is not generating as much heat as it would because the metabolism is not being stimulated as it would with normal levels of thyroid hormone. Another common cause is falls, people that fall and injure themselves and are immobilised in a cold environment. So most illness can lead to hypothermia, often not so much because of the illness itself, but more because of the immobility that it produces. The next category I want to think about is, is psychiatric reasons. We do come across this reasonably commonly in cold environments in psychiatric patients. It could be caused by depression, where the patient just doesn't see the point of keeping warm, where they just can't be bothered to put on clothes, where it seems futile to do so. This is the way depressed people think. So depression can lead to hypothermia in cold environments. Another one is, is, is in psychoses, especially in schizophrenia. Remember the frostbite, uh, the, the frostbitten foot we saw before, that was a schizophrenic patient where behaviour is irrational and where painful stimuli are sometimes not acted on. So the patient might be cold, but for psychiatric reasons, they don't do anything about it. It's irrational. I suppose under psychiatric reasons, we could also mention drug overdoses. Patients that take overdoses often become immobilised as well. Alcohol, of course, is a cause 
of hypothermia, as we mentioned, because it's a vasodilator and it induces the hypoglycemia, which inhibits the shivering. But of course, you're not going to become hypothermic in a very warm environment. This is a product of cold environments, that's fairly obvious. So if the environment's cold for a prolonged period of time and someone can't generate enough heat. Malnutrition can, can contribute towards this. If someone's malnourished, especially if it makes them hypoglycemic, they're not going to be able to shiver in a cold environment, so they're not going to be able to maintain body temperature normally. A very obvious cold environment is if someone falls into cold water, if they are immersed in a cold environment. Now water is a good conductor of heat. Air is a good insulator of heat. So if someone's in a cold environment, sorry, if they're in cold water, the heat is going to be conducted out of the body really quite efficiently. And patients can become hypothermic fairly quickly in cold water. Falling into cold water is a life-threatening situation. Another factor about the environment is if the person gets wet. If they're wet. Now, if someone could be in a fairly cold environment and yet remain reasonably warm if they're dry because the air is a good insulator. If it's windy, of course, that's going to blow away the heat. We talked about forced, uh, I think we called it forced convection in, in, the, uh, in the previous talk. That's going to cool them down. That's called wind chill factor. But even then, as long as someone's dry, very often they can maintain their body temperature reasonably well. But when you get wet, in a cold environment, then as the water evaporates from the surface of the body, the latent heat of vaporization is extracted from the surface of the body and someone can become hypothermic really quite quickly in cold environments where they're wet, especially if you add a wind chill factor to that. So you actually get young, fit people. They might be out on the hills walking. If it rains, and it's windy in a cool environment, it doesn't even have to be that cold, but the combination of the rain, the wind and the coldness, even young fit people can become hypothermic really quite quickly. So when people are training to deal with harsh environments, for example the military, they spend a lot of their time simply keeping everything dry. As long as you can keep dry, you're probably going to keep warm. In actual fact, what, what you train people to do is they, you train them to have some wet clothes and some dry clothes. So when they go outside to do jobs, they put their wet clothes on. But then when they get into the sleeping bag, they have dry clothes to put on. And when they're dry, they won't be losing heat. When they're wet, they, they will be losing heat. So a combination of the cold, being wet and wind chill. Three very important factors about the environment. Now the thing about hypothermia is that as the body temperature declines, the amount of heat it is able to generate also declines. So at 27 degrees centigrade, which would be a very severe hypothermia, the metabolic rate is two and a half times lower than at 37 degrees centigrade. So that means the body is generating way less heat. So the cooler the body is, the less heat it generates. So if you start becoming cool and you're immobile, you produce less heat. If you produce less heat, you become colder. If you become colder, you're in, your metabolic systems work more slowly, so you produce less heat. So it's a vicious spiral as you go down. The colder you are, the lower your metabolic rate. The lower your metabolic rate, the less heat you're producing. That's why if people go to sleep in very cold environments, the body temperature can carry on dropping. Because as the metabolic rate drops, the amount of heat that the body generates also drops. And then they just get colder and colder and colder, and ultimately, as we'll see, that can cause death. So hypothermia is preventable. In some cold parts of the world, in Siberia for example, uh, hypothermia is reasonably uncommon despite very extreme cold, because the people expect it and wrap up for it and prepare for it. So it's thinking about the temperature of the environment and preparing for it. Because basically, 
humans are designed for the tropics. Anywhere else we've got to wear clothes and, and take measures uh, to keep warm. Now there's other factors which can determine how likely it is that someone will become hypothermic. And an obvious one is the amount of subcutaneous fat, the amount of adipose tissue under the surface of the skin. Because adipose tissue is poorly perfused with blood, so not a lot of heat is lost from the blood passing through it, because there's not much blood in it passing through anyway. And as well as that, fat is a good insulator of heat it actually forms a layer round about the surface of the body. So people with thin layers of adipose tissue are going to lose heat more quickly than people with thick layers of adipose tissue. So someone that is relatively obese is going to cool down more slowly than someone who is relatively thin. And this is probably especially a factor in women who store adipose tissue all over the surface of the body. In men that are obese, often a lot of the fat is just stored in the abdomen and doesn't have a great deal of uh, effect in keeping them that warm. But people can also acclimatise to cold. So how well acclimatised an individual is, is going to make a difference. And sometimes you hear about people surviving extremely cold conditions. And very often you'll find that they are acclimatised to the cold. They've got used to it. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is iatrogenic causes of hypothermia. Because for those of us that work in hospitals, there's lots of things that we can do or not do to our patients that can result in the patient becoming hypothermic. And maybe the first one is fairly obvious, it's surgery. When a patient is anaesthetized, they're not going to be shivering, they're not going to be active, they're going to be completely inactive so they're not going to be generating a lot of heat, just by virtue of the fact they're anaesthetised. In addition, the operating environment can often be fairly cool, so again they can lose heat to the environment. Then if you start opening body cavities and exposing bowels, an awful lot of heat can be lost from body cavities, or from the wound, contributing to the hypothermia, making the patient colder. And it has been estimated that up to 50% of patients that undergo surgery do lose about 2 degrees of body temperature. And this can actually alter the, uh, the patient's reaction to, well, if the body temperature is lower, it can affect various organs. It can certainly affect the heart. It can reduce metabolic rate. It can alter the way blood coagulates. You know, it, it can alter quite a few things. So hypothermia may have a, a deleterious effect on the outcome of the surgery. So well worth keeping patients undergoing surgery warm normally. The converse of course is that when people are, um, people are warm they're going to bleed more. We've mentioned this before, cold people bleed less. So it may be that you want to keep a patient cool during surgery. But be aware of the advantages and disadvantages and get the patient's body temperature optimised for, for the conditions that you want, for the outcome that you want. So surgery. A&E departments can also be quite cold places, especially if you've got ill patients who are immobilised, lying around on trolleys in drafty corridors. So again, keep your patients nice and warm while they're waiting to go to the wards, because the body temperature can drop because of the immobility. If we're busy at work running around, we, we don't feel cold, but the, but the patients often do. Drugs are another possible cause of hypothermia. Now, phenothiazine drugs like chlorpromazine are known to lower body temperature, 
But any sedative drug again is going to cause relative immobility and allow patients' body temperatures to start to drop. Another possible uh, way of cooling patients down is washing them. Because when patients are wet, again, they're going to lose the latent heat of vaporisation from the surface of the body. So in hospitals, especially in winter time, in places like the United Kingdom, North America, it is possible that patients actually do become really quite cold. Now I've called this iatrogenic causes. Iatro means doctor, so this actually means doctor caused. But when we talk about iatrogenic, we normally mean anything caused by medical treatment in a hospital. So I've called this iatrogenic causes. I'm not sure if it's the right, right use of the term actually. What I mean is any patient that can become, sorry, I mean reasons why a patient might become hypothermic in hospital.